Welcome to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bonneau, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go. So today my guest is Hayley Kalani McDonald. She's a seasoned marketing professional with over a decade of experience. She's focusing on creating attention-grabbing content, leading dynamic creative teams and crafting outstanding advertising campaigns. Thank you for joining us, Hayley. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Let's start with a bit of background. Tell me, how did you get into marketing? You said you've been doing it for about a decade. How has it changed over time? What gets you excited about it? Yeah. So I have been interested in, really, I fell into marketing almost by accident. And it was, as I was growing up, I was actually really into music. So I played in a couple of like cover bands growing up and then eventually got into the production side. So everything that happens before the record or the song comes out. And at that time I was living in Seattle, Washington, interning at a recording studio. And I was surrounded by so much talent and passion from the people who were there, everybody from the musicians to songwriters to the audio engineers. Um, and almost every single one of them that I would come across would be struggling to make any sort of money from mm. the thing that they love the most and the thing that they felt they were best at, including myself. So that really got me thinking, well, how do I create attention? Like I know that if people just found you and listen to your music, they would fall in love with your, your band. And so that got me uh, down the rabbit hole of asking questions like a marketer. How do I build an audience? How do I capture attention? How do I retain that attention and turn it into somebody that wants to buy something from us? Mm. And as I kept progressing into that, I also fell in love with the social media marketing side of things. Um, TikTok didn't exist yet. And, uh, you know, Instagram was, uh, Facebook was like slowly <laughs> turning into where, um, you know, Gen uh, X and, and boomers were hanging out. And so I started experimenting with my own music and then eventually with other bands, other recording studios, doing a lot of done for you marketing work. So anything from their social media ads to their copy, to their emails, to their content, to filming, to editing, mm. everything. And that's when I was like, okay, let me get better educated in this. And so I got certified and continued working with people in my sphere um, until one day I was like, I think I need to start a business at this point to do this. And mm -hmm. the one thing that I loved more than music was being my own boss and having that autonomy. So I decided to go the entrepreneur route, started my business in about five years ago, and then never looked back. And uh, since the beginning of doing a lot of done for you stuff. I've really transitioned into the consulting space for creative strategy, social media strategy, all that good stuff. Um, because I realized that a lot of the ideas that go into the implementation are really the more important part. Mm. And do you focus like the, the type of um, the, the type of clients you work with? Are, are they still primarily in the music industry or, or what, what is your sort of typical clients. Yeah. Well, it's funny is when I first started doing this, it, I was doing it with the things that I was interested in. So music mm. first, and I loved fitness and weightlifting and jujitsu. So I started working with fitness gyms and CrossFit gyms and jujitsu mm. gyms. Um, and then I was into real estate. So I started working with real estate brokerages and it was a way for me to, in some sense, get to taste and test a lot of different industries and mm. businesses. And I just love the variety. And I quickly mm. realized too, wow, okay, marketing are these pillars, these foundational pieces. And then anything that you plug in and play to it, as long as it's specific to the brand and, and the personality of that brand, 
it can work. Um, and so that gave me a lot of flexibility. So to directly answer your questions, I don't directly work with any recording studios right now. Um, but a lot of my clients are in different industries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you feel it's, there's a, like a huge difference? Cause I, I would imagine, obviously it's specific, like when, when a client approaches you and you obviously have to tailor your services to their industry, to their particular brand, uh, et cetera. But do you feel there's some things that are really like completely different from industry to industry or, or there's some things that are the same across the board? That's a really good question. I think that the biggest difference that I see is the B2B side versus the B2C side mm. because the things that they <laughs> want and care about are drastically different. Like, you know, work mode versus personal life mode, right? Like if you have coworkers and you're in a corporate company and you see them outside of work, they're a different person. Right? Mm. And so when we're in the B2B mindset, it, um, the efforts do change as far as, okay, how do we make sure that the content that we're creating isn't just edutainment necessarily, but it does hold attention and it is giving the right information to the right person. So I would say that's the biggest difference, for, but mm. truly for the most part, um, I really can't think of anything else that would be different. It really does mm. come down to a lot of the basics, in my opinion, uh, of marketing, of, of just mm. really understanding your, your core person, mm -hmm. your core audience, your ideal buyer. Um, I find it funny because you, you just said, when you said the main difference between B2B and B2C, you said, um, the main difference is what they like, what they want and what they, the, the focus was on them, not their clients. And I, I think that's something that is very interesting because um, I often hear that when I work with, uh, and I talk with people about uh, domain names and I have that objection very often where, where entrepreneurs say, well, we're B2B, like our domain name doesn't matter that much. And we're not, you know, mm. B2C. And as you were saying what they want, I think people oftentimes forget that what they want and what they feel and what they think is not necessarily and oftentimes not at all what their clients feel um, and have as an experience. And even if you're in a B2B, you're ultimately still dealing with people at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah, you're still dealing with people and you're still dealing with people who are in a specific state of mind, right? So mm. if it's a B2B software service, as an example, you know, the, the, your clients, the people that you're selling to are in work mode still. And mm. so the way that they interact with content, the way that they interact with your website is probably differently, um, because they're, for lack of a better word or phrase, they're action oriented, like in the moment they're most likely just doing a job. So if it's a mm. recruiter or a manager or somebody who comes across your software and they, they are mainly looking to qualify at that point, is this what we need or is this what we not need? And that's where branding becomes really important because like you said, at the end of the day, they're just people. And so mm. if you can have the right balance of I'm connecting with this person who is on the other side of the screen doing essentially maybe what their boss told them or checking mm. off a task for the day. If I can still resonate with them while meeting their company's needs for this software, then I can ultimately build a better relationship um, in the moment with that person. Mm. That's a very important thing. I think you, you, you mentioned that that's very much, and I've never thought about it that way, that that's very much the difference between uh, B2B and B2C. Like you're still dealing with people, but you're dealing with people that are in a different uh, space, if we can say that in their head, in a different yeah. capacity, but there are still, you know, people. So that that's really cool that you, you kind of define mm -hmm. it that, that simply. And I did mention that you focus on, on creating um, attention grabbing content. Talk to me a little bit more about that. And, and now that we've touched on how it differentiates, you know, B2C, B2B, how, how does that all work? Yeah. I think for, if, if we look at the difference between B2B and B2C, to me, it's easier to create attention grabbing content for B2C clients mm. because we, 
again, we're in a different headspace. We're in a different frame of mind. We're just hanging out. We want to chill. We want, we have time to be able to Mm. scroll or check out a website or whatever. Um, and so when it comes to creating attention, grabbing content for either B2B or B2C, to me, it really comes down to the foundation of like human behavior and psychology. It's like, okay, how can we create something that is short and sweet right in the first second or two seconds? Can we capture their attention? And then can we deliver on the thing that is in our headline or the first sentence of our caption, right? So there's, to me, it's almost like a a formula if you think about Mm. it this way. You've got the the hook, right? You've got the the middle, like, and then you've got the call to action at the end. But it's starting to look at, okay, how do I make this hook the most interesting thing that my ideal client has seen all day today? It doesn't have to be the most interesting thing ever, right? Like you're not mm. some big YouTube creator like Mr. Beast who's spending millions of dollars on every video. <laughs> you know, it can be more simple than that. But there are frameworks that big creators like him and like others use to hold your attention. And the mm. way that I like to do it for myself and for my clients is look at YouTube creators or even like reality TV, right? These are things that have been created that capture people's attention for hours and they're obsessed with it. Mm. So studying people like that um, and dissecting not necessarily what's in the video, but how they frame the video, how they cut the video, what is said in the first two seconds and then 10 seconds later to hold your attention. Most of the Mm. time, they leave you wanting more with posing something that's going to create a question in your mind that you're like, now I need this thing answered. So hopefully that answered your question for the mm-hmm. most part. But I, I think that the easiest way to do it for me is looking at other creators specifically and in creative industries that have done it really well. Movies, mm-hmm. TV, books, YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. And do you focus more or exclusively on video creation or all type of content? All type of content. I really enjoy video, Um, Mm. but there is very much an art to crafting a lot of attention on something that isn't visual. I mean, yes, Mm -hmm. you're reading something, but how many people read blogs all day versus watch TikToks all day? (laughs) There's Mm -hmm. a big uh, difference. And so being able to create written content that's very compelling and engaging is fairly different than creating video content that's Mm -hmm. compelling and engaging. So they're both, I like to call them mediums, like mediums of art, because I really do think that content is an art form. Mm -hmm. So the medium of content is different, just like oil painting is different than watercolor. Mm. And over the the course of your career, have you seen that uh, shifting? That's like mixed for for an entrepreneur. Let's say, um, like I don't know. I mean, I remember back in the days where when I started working in IT, it was like really actually hard to convince people they even need a website. They were like, "Oh, I have a profile on you know Yellow Pages or whatever." People would just find me, you know. And and now it's like there's so many things you can do. So how has that mix changed over time? And, and where do you feel it's going? Like where should mm-hmm. entrepreneurs focus in terms of uh, their efforts on creating content? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that the views on marketing have definitely shifted in the last five to 10 years, especially the last five. I think that even in the last five years, companies, um, maybe small business owners that are owned by somebody who's maybe Gen X or boomer age, they know marketing is important, but for them, like the sales, the people, the butts in the seats, that's the most important thing to them, which it should be, right? That's how your Mm. business stays afloat. However, marketing and sales go hand in hand. To me, if you just have one, you're significantly limiting yourself. Or even if they're just unbalanced, right? You can't have Mm. too much marketing and really crappy sales and vice versa. Um, So I think that that has shifted. People realize that marketing is up there with sales because we're bringing you all the people. 
And I think another thing too that has has shifted the way that entrepreneurs, specifically um, younger entrepreneurs, millennial age, uh, they are excited at the opportunity to market because now it is so accessible. And over the last mm. four or five years, they've seen people seemingly right pop off, right? They, they see a video and they're like this per this creator grew or this business grew in one year. And now they're making, you know, $200,000, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so we just see it more often. And I think people almost in a sense, it's like, I can win the lottery type thing. It's like, I can do it. If I just post enough videos, I can do it. Mm -hmm. True, but I, I think that the way that it is um, highlighted specifically and celebrated, it gets more people interested in marketing. And so they're mm. more willing to try it. They're more willing to put that skill in their arsenal than they probably were more than five mm. years ago. And it has become like that necessary skill or tool that you do have in your arsenal rather than just an option. Oh, mm. it's an afterthought. Now it's like, I have to be really good at sales have to be really good at marketing, have to be really good at product. And if I'm mm. if anything else can be done later, but those are the three things that I need to make my business successful. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about consistency, which is something like, because I deal with domain names, it kind of pops up often where as part of, of that mix of as part of a brand where you know you'd have a company that's called something and then like their domain name is uh, hello something and that creates that you know traffic lost emails lost uh, confusion etc like all, all of those uh, issues where what are your thoughts on consistency and generally when it comes to marketing and branding mm -hmm. and when you say consistency you mean as far as like keeping the same kind of branding or as far as like keeping up with the activities that are required in marketing? Uh, keeping up, I would say, a consistent message and consistent and mm -hmm. everything that goes with it. So like visual identity, um, right. what the brand stands for and access points where, where people can interact with it. So yeah. In a way, I guess I see it as, as making people's life easier when they try and reach you and recognize you. Yeah, that's huge. I think that if you're inconsistent and drastically inconsistent, maybe it's with the colors and the messaging or just one or the other, um, it really can cause a lot of confusion, especially if you've been in business for a while. And the main reason being is, let's say you hopefully you have a really good product or service, people are going to be doing a lot of word of mouth. And mm -hmm. if they had one experience coming to your website or your socials, and now three months later, this other client that got referred by this one comes and has a totally different experience, it's going to shift what you're seen as. Um, mm -hmm. And it will look inconsistent. It might even look like you don't know what you're doing, you know, although maybe that's very well not true. And so when you make, when you're in the very beginning stages, to me, it would be easier to say, okay, am I willing to live with this type of messaging, this type of branding as far as look, tone, feel, um, my, my images, like the vibe that I give off, am I okay with this for the next 10, 20 years? And if the answer is no, then take some more time before you launch just to get it right to where you're like, okay, this feels good. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you can't change. But if you do change in the future, you want the changes to be pretty subtle. Like if I have, you know, I have more pastel tones in my branding, it's blues and warm pinks and stuff like that. Um, if I were to change in the future, it would still probably be shades of blues and pinks. Uh, mm. Same thing with my messaging, right? I used to be a lot more playful in my messaging. I still am, but I tone it down just a little bit. And so mm. nothing has drastically changed. But I will say in the first like six months of my business, <laughs> so many things changed because I didn't prepare and I didn't really fully understand the importance of brand consistency. Mm. And so when I first launched my business, it was called Eastside Digital Marketing, 
which is <laughs> totally different. Um, and I knew I wanted to go into consulting too. And I didn't always want to stay in digital marketing. So it, it's just an example of, yeah, it uh, take a little bit longer if you're in the beginning to feel good about what you're mm. going to pick as far as branding, look, tone, feel, messaging, all that. And then if you do make changes, make them very small. Mm. I, I, I totally uh, agree with you and on the story with your your name that you just mentioned there. And I've seen so many um, entrepreneurs go through that. And I, I think it's a, yeah, it, the advice of taking a little bit of time to thinking through it. it. It's not just a small detail. And I would also add, try to think ahead. I think that's a good way. Mm-hmm. And if you look at Amazon Springs to mind, as an obvious one, but I'm pretty sure like if you, you know, look at, read, uh, listen to podcasts, et cetera, of mm-hmm. any successful, like huge company, um, entrepreneur, founder, they always at the beginning of those stories, you have that moment where they are talking about that huge company and everybody thinks they're crazy. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it's that where they saw that. And when you see that, when you see, um, when you have that big vision, even mm-hmm. if everybody thinks you're crazy, even if you think you're crazy yourself, you mm-hmm. build things differently. You think differently. You're thinking, you know, I'm not going to call it, uh, you know, my little, I don't know, <laughs> dog toys, whatever. Because you're thinking, yeah. yeah, maybe I'll start with little dog toys, but I'm going to expand on to XYZ. And so I need a different name. And so I need a different messaging. And so I need a different, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. So I think that's very, um, very good way to, to think about yeah. it just try and think ahead, even if it seems crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, I like that you put that in there because I think that having the vision of assuming that you're going to make it to a company that's going to last forever. Um, mm. one, when you shoot for the stars, you're going to reach the moon sort of thing. Right. But two, let's say it happens. How much regret are you going to have if you chose the super niche specific domain as an example, or these really Mm. specific messaging, and then even five years down the line, you're ready to switch it up. Um, So yeah, I really think that that's super valuable tip. Mm. So as we were touching on that, like common mistakes, that's definitely one of them. What do you feel up some, like, let's, I don't know, let's not put a number, but a few common mistakes that you'd be like, hear often see often like give you like you know people reach out to me like oh not that again <laughs> yeah yeah uh one of the most common ones is looking at other people's content or website or messaging and then trying to emulate that yourself because if you're taking in inspiration is great but if you're you're really not inspired by it and you just think oh well this sec this company is successful. If I do the same thing, I will be Mm -hmm. successful. And it happens mostly with content, not so much with copywriting because then it gets into, wow, this really has to sound different. But with content, especially a lot of business Mm -hmm. owners will be making, let's say video content with a very, uh, a certain type of look and feel looking like maybe Gary V or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't resonate with them but they think they should do it. And if it doesn't Mm. resonate with you, your audience can really smell the the disauthenticity, if that's a word. Mm -hmm. And I think that humans are really good at just sniffing out the BS. And so if it doesn't resonate with you, it's not going to resonate with them. That's Mm. probably the biggest mistake that I see. Another thing would be that usually this happens more so in the beginning, not after they've been in business for a while, um, clarity on who they're actually serving. And this is mainly Mm. for solopreneurs. I see that they have 20 different people that they serve, but only five, maybe three of them are like the people that they enjoy working with and the people Mm. that pay them the most. And don't have many objections. Like that's your core audience, not the 19 other people or the 15 other people that you had to kind of like really reel in and almost convince Mm. to work with you. Um, That's the other thing. And then making content for that core person rather than the 15 other that were hard to deal with. Mm. So those are probably the two biggest ones. Um, You know, I don't know if there's 
there, there's a lot in specific scenarios, right? Mm. Like, oh, I'm not comfortable on camera. That's a big one. Or mm. oh, I'm not a very good storyteller. That's a big one. And a lot of those just come with not having enough experience in, in doing mm. it. If they're not going to hire, you know, contract out their marketing, if they have to do it themselves for a period of time, those are the other, um, maybe not mistakes, but challenges and hurdles that they mm. come across that stop them from creating the type of content that is best for them, that they're actually going to be consistent with, and that resonates with their audience the most. Mm, absolutely. I, I have to say, as you were talking about, like the first example, where people are trying to like emulate or, or pretty much literally copy like others' behavior. I've seen so much of that lately on LinkedIn. I have to say it, it's painful to watch. I'm like, just don't yeah. do that. It's so obvious. It, it, it's, it's yeah, just don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens a lot. And I think it's because we don't, we sometimes worry that what we have isn't enough. Like, oh, I I'm, I'm, mm. can't resonate with that well. Or I'm, like I said, I'm not a good storyteller. These things that we tell ourselves or that we just assume and we don't take enough time to be like, well, if I were to take my thoughts and put them out on paper, what would that look like? And then starting as mm. that base point for all of your content creation. Mm. What are your thoughts on, on artificial intelligence and chat GPT, I guess, in particular, now that it's like flooding everything? I think I'm getting allergic to opening emails now because it's all <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> it's, it, it's just crazy how people think it's not obvious. But yeah, but how, how, how has it affected content creation and where do you think it's going? Mm-hmm. So far, I think that it's been beneficial in the sense that it makes certain tasks faster. Mm. Um, I don't think that it replaces anything at this point in time. I do think that you can use it in many different ways to just help make your work day a little bit more efficient. So I'll use it for, um, if I have client content and we're batching out certain stuff, I'll have one certain thread, let's say on chat GPT, that's only for this client. So the AI is learning what this client's business is their marketing, their branding behind it, all that stuff. Um, and then it can plop out a hundred ideas, right? In five seconds mm. or less. And from those, to me, I like to think about it as like a thinking partner mm. because I work remotely. I, I'm a solopreneur as well. And my client's job is not necessarily to come up with all the ideas. That's pretty much my job. So a creative thinking partner, partner I think is cool. And I think right now, AI and ChatGPT and all the other platforms like ChatGPT are nice to be able to bounce ideas off of and get feedback from, and then also make your workflow a little bit more systemized. Like it can create Mm. tables and graphs and all that, which is nice for, you know, if you need something for your analytics and you're delivering that to your client. Um, But I do think that at some point, like for video editing and stuff, AI is uh, a lot better at being able to take large podcasts, for example, trim them down, make social media clips out of them. Mm. And it takes out hours of work that uh, just allows somebody to take on more projects at this point. But I don't think, I think we're still quite a ways away from it replacing, you know, every job, but I do Mm. think that it will open up more jobs for creativity. Like Mm. the person who has to input something into the AI machine um, in order for it to spit something back out. And that's the difference. It's like, okay, I want, AI to do this thing. And that to me, only a human can do. And it'll be mm. transferred into more creative jobs, not necessarily, you know, just video editing, right? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. I think there was that uh, initial phase of, oh my God, like we're all going to be out of job and uh, jobs. And uh, I, I don't see that at all. But I do feel like, um, 
well, it's almost like when, you know, when, when the internet came around and it, it's like, if we were to, to complain about, oh no, you know, my kids now, when they have to do some presentation, they just type in Google and, you know, they find stuff and I had to go to the library and wait to rent the books because, you know, other kids had them and, and then read them. Actually, there was no control. I fly like, <laughs> and good yeah. stuff. So it's like, nobody's complaining about that. You know, it's a like next stage of that yeah. development but yeah i don't think it's replacing us in any human job in any way it's actually enhancing it and making it quicker and better yeah exactly and it'll be a while before the jobs that can be replaced by ai do get replaced and just like you said when the internet came along a certain sector of people, yes, did lose their jobs, but they also just mm. got different jobs that were related to using the internet instead mm. of being replaced by it. So we we'll, we already have jobs that use AI now instead of the job that AI is now doing. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Last question. So when and like, yeah, when should somebody reach out to it? What point at what stage of development of their business should they reach out to you and do you have some type of a um, specific like size of a company location geographically that you work with don't work with Mm -hmm. so i typically work with seven to eight figure brands that have a marketing team of anywhere from two to five or more people Um, that's my bread and butter it's uh, really fun to be able to work with team totally dedicated to marketing. But I also understand that not everybody is in that place. And so for small businesses that I do work with, sometimes they have one social media person on their team, or it's just them. So I do work in that capacity. And the most common phase that they're in for those small to medium sized businesses is that they've been able to up to this point to have a successful business where they've got happy customers, they're not drowning, right? Um, And they're ready to take it to the next level. They want to expand. They want to double their revenue. They want to be able to make this business into a brand. Um, So that's usually for the small to medium-sized businesses. And then for the brands that are a little larger and have larger teams, for the most part, they're trying to avoid that plateau where, you know, we, we're, we're going steady, we have uh, a brand made for ourselves, at least in the cities that we are, um, and we want to be able to take it again to the next level. We want to create stuff that people say, oh my gosh, what is this place and how do I work with them? So those are the two types of clients that I work with and usually the capacities that I work with them in. If it's teams, we work a lot on campaigns, social media campaigns, event campaigns, things of that sort. Cool. All right. Well, that's been an absolute pleasure. We'll include the links uh, in the comments to the podcast where people can reach you. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed that our conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Smart Branding Podcast. Feel free to visit smartbranding.com for more information and reach out if you have any suggestions, questions, ideas, or just want to learn more about how a good domain name strategy can help you build a strong and successful brand. See you next time.